Tonight's lecture is entitled, Changing the Word. And this is quite a serious topic, and people get very excited about it. Verses affected in the Bibles, a rough count would give us the New American Standard Bible, 909 verses. That's a lot. The Revised Version, 788 verses. The New World Translation, 767. The NIV, 695. The Good News Bible, 614. The Amplified, 484. The Douay, which is the Jesuit Bible, has fewer changes than the New American Standard. In fact, less than half. Amazing. And the Reformation, of course, rejected this completely, but they're quite happy to accept these ones. Very strange. The old Jehovah's Witness Bible only had 120 verses affected. And when that came out, there was a huge hue and cry over the massive changes that they made. And today, nobody realizes that they're sitting with 909 verses affected, which makes the 120 look like a kindergarten. The New King James Version ignored the Textus Receptus 1,200 times. The Jehovah's Witness Bible is the first one that was changed. Matthew 16, verse 3, for example. If we go from there onwards, you'll see they removed that one, irrespective of what that text means. I'll show you later in the others that everything that was changed in the Jehovah's Witness Bible has also been changed in the other Bibles, or at least discredited in the margin, if nothing else. So they took... Uh, Matthew 16, verse 3 out. When it came to the book of Mark, they took verse 46 out. They had to cross it out. When it came to Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, well, they just took out the whole chapter. Because why? Because here Jesus appears physically after the resurrection, and that is a problem. You see, the esoteric world teaches that there is no physical resurrection. It is esoteric. And a physical Jesus, having raised, been raised from the dead, is a problem. So take out the chapter and modify the chapters other than Mark that are not quite as blatant on the issue. So if you have one of the modern translations, it will at least say in the margin that this is not found in the oldest manuscripts, but as we saw, the oldest manuscripts were already corrupt because they had the modifications of Oregon, as we will see. John 1, verse 1, in the New World Translation, that's the, the, the Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses, as they have written it, it says there, in the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Whereas the King James says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So obviously, Jesus was God in the King James, but uh, he was a lesser being, if you like, with a lowercase g, when it comes to the uh, New World Translation. Then when it comes to John chapter 1, 11, uh, chapter 8, 11, up to verse 11, the whole series just gone. Just take a pen, ladies and gentlemen, cross it out. We no, need it no longer. We have found something better. Acts 8, verse 37 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible is, of course, removed because there Jesus is the only way to be saved. Away with that text. You'll find it missing in the others as well. 1 John 5, verse 7 is a major problem because there here Jesus is part of the Godhood. Gone. We'll come to that in the others as well. So that's what Jehovah's Witnesses did. They just took their pens and they crossed out all these relevant verses and whole portions of chapters and whole chapters. And there was a huge hue and cry about it. Now imagine that the Bibles that we have today do more than that and nobody complains. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange how we have changed? Dublin Review, 1881. By the sole authority of textual criticism, not in other words by the word itself, not what it says, but by textual criticism, these men have dared to vote away some 40 verses of the inspired word. This was early. 
Now, as you see, hundreds of verses are affected. The eunuch's baptismal profession of faith is gone, and the angel of the pool of Bethesda has vanished, but the angel of the agony remains. Till the next revision, the heavenly witnesses have departed, and no marginal note mourns their loss. The last 12 verses of St. Mark are detached from the rest of the gospel as if ready for removal as soon as Dean Bergen dies. Remember I quoted a lot from Dean Bergen yesterday? When he goes, they said, well, they're going to change a lot more. And they surely have. The account of the woman taken in adultery is placed in brackets, awaiting excision. Many other passengers have a mark set against them in the margin to show that like forest trees, they are shortly destined for the critic's axe. Who can tell when the destruction will cease? That was in 1881, when they just started revising the Bible. Isn't that incredible? Well, let's see what the modern people say. This is what modern Bible society say. Novum Testamentum Grecae, the German Bible Society, Stuttgart. What has that got to say? It says, when Eberhard Nestle in 1898 presented the first edition of Novum Testamentum Grecae, he had achieved a work of which the consequences were not only unknown to him at the time, but also to the Württemberg Bible Society that made the edition possible. If the Textus Receptus at that time still had a number of defenders, the science, note that, the science of the 19th century had however finally proved it, to be the worst text of the New Testament. So the Bible, the Textus Receptus, that had stood the test of time until 1900, now suddenly was the worst text available. There, the editions of Tischendorf, that's the man who discovered that piece of rubbish in a waste paper basket on which all the modern Bibles are based since 1841, finalized edition of such and such and such and such, and Westcott and Hort came in 1881, controlled the field. But in practical terms, at the level of the university, church, school, the edition of the Textus Receptus was still largely used internationally, as for example by the British Bible Society until 1904. Irrespective of the changes, the British didn't change that easily. Only with the release of the Nestle text did the rule of the Textus Receptus come to an end here also. Much rejoicing in Roman Catholic circles that finally managed to destroy the Textus Receptus. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us something about Oregon. We'll see in a moment. The received text, the Textus Receptus, is the old Byzantine text with hundreds of copies in agreement. It was written in Koin Greek. Note that, written in Koin Greek, of which hundreds of words cannot be translated into classical Greek. The early church used Koin Greek manuscripts and rejected the Alexandrian versions, which were based on the corrupt versions, which Oregon and other Gnostic revisions. Now, the Encyclopedia Britannica tells us that Oregon taught that Jesus was a created being who did not have eternal existence as God. So that's the basis. If you want to have an ecumenical Bible, you have to remove Jesus Christ as the sole Savior and as God. It has to be done. Well, what does the Bible say about the secret initiation? Isaiah 45, verse 19. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Wow, that sounds nice. I like that. Isaiah 48, 16. Come ye, ye near unto me. Hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there I am, and now the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. No secrets with God. Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He reveals His secret unto the servants, the prophets. Mark 4 verse 22, let's go to the New Testament. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. 
Luke 8 verse 17, For nothing is secret, there shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Luke 11, 33, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. John 7, verse 4, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. Which doctrine do you prefer? Those of the enlightened enlightened initiated ones or those of the Bible which God would you prefer to serve the God of the initiated ones or the God of the Bible I like this one I like Jesus Christ let me tell you what Jesus said John 18 verse 20 Jesus answered him and sp him I spake openly to the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whether the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Which God do you prefer? I prefer this one. I hate the secrecy, this clandestine religion, this I know more than you story. Isn't it disgusting? I know the path and I don't care if you don't make it, you're just a catechumen. Well, let's have a look how they changed it, these initiated ones, to keep the truth away from the rest of the world. Which verses did they change? We know they changed them. Let's just have a few easy ones, and then we'll get deeper and deeper into the doctrine. Remember a few things. Remember that Hort said, we will change it very slightly. Here a word, there a word, and nobody will even notice. And finally, when we have it all together, when we have all the little changes in one big package, if you read it all together, our doctrine, and not theirs, will be there. Isn't that what he said? That's exactly what he said. So, NIV, 2 Samuel 21, 19. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elahin, son of Yarekum, the Bethlehem, the might, killed Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Oops, who killed him? Elan, son of Yare Origim, King James. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elanan, the son of, same one, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Who did kill Goliath? Oh, so you prefer the King James Version over the other one, over the NIV? 2 Samuel 23, verse 5, NIV. Is not my house right with God, King James Version, although my house be not so with God? So they turn everything around. When God says it's not right, the NIV says it is right. Another one, Hosea eleven twelve, And Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful Holy One. King James, but Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. You see, God had said, Ephraim has left me, Israel has left me, but Judah is still with me. Satan doesn't like that, so he says, no, all of them were against me. So he changed that too. There's a little change. It's, you know, it's minor, but it, it's quite important. Now, either with God or you're against God. Matthew 5, 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who per persecute you. Revised Standard Version. King James Version. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, let's just take that out, and then uh, we don't have a full story anymore. Matthew 18, verse 11. Don't you think this is an important text? For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Don't you think that is an important text? I think it's a very important text. Why is it, why is it gone in the Revised Standard Version? Because Jesus is not supposed to be the only Savior. You say, we're supposed to save ourselves. Didn't Masonry teach that we can save ourselves? We don't need Jesus. That's a ridiculous teaching. It's just an example. 
Matthew 20, 16, the Revised Standard Version. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Nice. And the King James? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many are called, but few are chosen. You see, here it makes a difference. Here it is important to choose. To choose right. Here, you just come first to last, who cares? But here, you could be last if you don't make the right choice. Which one do you think is the correct one? So, away with the choice business. Matthew chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. Well, the NIV says, you don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Nice. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared for by my Father. What does the King James say? Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. You are, able to drink, are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? Can you go through the same? Can you go through suffering for my sake? Matthew 25, 13. Very important, RSV. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now tell me, is that a logical text for the God of the universe to put into the Bible? To say... Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Of what? Hello? Of what? Wherein the Son of Man cometh. Doesn't that make sense? So which one is even the more logical one? Obviously this one. So now please note that in this one you know neither the day nor the hour of when the ice cream man will come along or whatever. But in this one, it's important, wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now let's go a little bit further. Notice what the NIV does in Matthew 24, 36. No one knows about that day that we just read about, or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Have you read that? Have you read that text? Nor the Son? What does the King James Version say? But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Where is the nor the Son bit? It's not there. Now if you take the verse where Jesus says, I and the Father are one, then what does that make of this verse? Does Jesus then know when he's coming, yes or no? Absolutely. But what does it imply? if you put there nor the Son. It implies that Jesus is not part of the Godhood. Are you with me? It implies that Jesus is not part of the Godhood. This is a serious change. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. How nice. Hello, sinners. Here you come to me. This is great. The NIV. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. King James. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Wow. Here there's an action. This is ecumenical. Let's all have a party together. It doesn't matter whether you believe the same thing, whether you keep the Ten Commandments, whatever you do, if you believe that you can, you know, sleep around with 50 women at the same time, who cares? No, no, no. The King James says, to repentance. So, take it out. We don't need that. We are initiated ones. We are above that. Mark chapter 6, verse 11. If any, place, if any place will not receive you and they refuse to hear you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet for a testimony against them. What's, what does the King James say? And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Why do you think that verse has been removed? 
Why do they remove the verse which says it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah? Because they do not believe in a judgment. You see, the choice that you make, who cares? Didn't they believe in reincarnation? Whatever you did wrong now, who cares? You can fix it next time round. And even if you can't fix it next time round, in purgatory, you can burn it off. That's fine. So, let's take the judgment right out. That'll solve the problem. Then we've modified that text. Can you see how many pieces are missing? So, I'm not talking about whole verses here. We're just looking at half verses and these things. Mark 10, verse 21. Revised Standard Version, and come follow me, NIV. Then come follow me, ASV. Come follow me, King James. And come take up the cross and follow me. What's the difference between those two? Here is a cross to bear. When you become a Christian, there is a change in life, and there is a cross to bear. And that is Christianity. The other is what? Salvation in sin, one big happy party. Mark 10, verse 21. Why would they take that out? Isn't it incredible? Just take it out. Why not? Mark 10, verse 24, RSV. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. The NIV. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Wow, even worse. King James Version. Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. What's the difference between those two? Well, here, you might as well give up from the beginning and rather reincarnate a couple of times. Here, better not get rich. Better give all your money away. Here, money is not the problem. It's making an idol of money that's a problem. Isn't that correct? You can be rich. But you can do a lot of good for the Lord God. You can do a lot of good. So this one is the only one that makes any sense. This one is just discouragement. My God is a God of encouragement, not discouragement. Take it out. We don't need that. We need arms, after all. If you have to keep uh, the monasteries and the nunneries going, you better take that verse out. Mark 13, verse 14. But when you see the desolated sacrilege set up where it ought not to be. Well, this is fascinating. But when you see the abomination, this is King James, of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not to be. Why take that out? Because Jesus is pointing to two specific apocalyptic books in the Bible where we should study for the end times. The one is the book of Daniel and the other one is the book of Revelation. Blessed are they that read the words of this book, it says in terms of Revelation, and it says, when you see this spoken of by the prophet Daniel, go and look over there, you'll find some answers there, because they were asked, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Check it out in the book of Daniel, Jesus said. Well, let's take away the evidence. Just remove it. They don't like that prophecy. Luke chapter 2, verse 14, Revised Standard Version. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace amongst men, with whom he is pleased. King James, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now, what's the difference between those two? It's a very subtle change, but what is the change? Here there's an initiated few with whom he is pleased. There, God is for everyone, not two classes. This is for the initiated insider. This is for the catechumens included. Cannot be. Change it. See what I mean? It's disgusting. It's really disgusting what they're doing here. Luke chapter 4 verse 4. And it's not in harmony with the character of God. That's the important principle. So it's not a question of grammar, it's a question of principle. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. And Jesus answered him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Revised Standard Version. NIV. Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live by bread alone. Is that right? 
King James Version. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Oops, we're changing it all, so we better remove that or else we rebuke ourselves, right? So, let's just take it out. The word is not important today. The word is just merely incidental. What is important is what you feel. What you feel is right. God will lead you through his spirit. All religions lead to the ultimate source. Trust your feelings. Forget about the word. Isn't that the teaching of the world today? Isn't that what they teach? But if you trust every word of God, you better make sure that you know what God wants and make the necessary changes. 2 Timothy 3.16, the ASV, every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. King James Version, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. They changed one little word. What's the difference? One little word. We will change, said Hort, a little bit here, a little bit there, and they won't even notice it. They're after all, catechumens, they're so stupid, they won't notice. What is this? Here, only that scripture which is inspired by God is profitable. So which is inspired and which is not? Well, that's for the initiator to decide, isn't it? That's why the Pope will tell you what to believe and you can't just read for yourself because then you are heresis. You make your own choice and that is heresy. You're subject to the penalty of death. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Luke chapter 9, verse 55 and 56. Just look what disappears. RSV. But he turned and rebuked them, and they went into another village. The NIV. But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went into another village. You know, besides being strange, it's, it's a stupid verse. It's stupid. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went into another village. Now which one to you makes more sense? Which one is important? Which one is more important to you? This one has power. This one has a savior. This one has an answer to all your troubles. This one has no answer whatsoever. It might as well not be in the Bible. And I don't believe God ever put something so ridiculous as that in the Bible. Luke chapter 22, verse 43 and 44. Gone. You won't find it in the RSV. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Why do you think they removed that text? Remember, they don't believe in the atonement. And if they don't believe in the atonement, they don't believe that Jesus shed one drop of blood for you. <laughs> Away with that disgusting doctrine of the atonement, as Hort claims. These are serious changes. And the Lord says that people who touch his word like this and remove Jesus Christ from the gospel are going to have to pay the price. John chapter 14 10 verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. King James Version. This is subtle. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. There's a subtle difference there. All right? In view of the next succeeding words, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, this change destroys the exquisite diversity of expression of the original. It makes grammatical sense and it gives the relationship between Father and Son, which means that Jesus is God. It's a subtle change to remove some of the power of Jesus Christ. Acts, 8, Acts 28, verse 29. Let it be known to you then that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning amongst themselves, says the King James. Now why does the book of Acts have to have that removed in the RSV? I'll tell you why. 
Because when you decide for or against this subject, it's going to be divisive. It's going to be divisive. And they had great reasoning amongst themselves. But a spirit of ecumenism says, everybody come together, we are one happy family. Here, there is a spirit of separation. Do you understand the difference? Very important difference. So Jesus makes a difference. The gospel is a two-edged sword which strikes and cuts through to the marrow. And people make a decision based on the facts. And they either move to the one camp or the other camp. So that is why verse 29 in an ecumenical Bible had to go. Because great reasoning and a split came between them. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 28. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then out of consideration for the man who informed you, and for conscience sake, etc. King James Version. But if any may say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So why are there certain rules in the Bible? Because God owns it. And who owns it here? The Lord. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. So, ooh, we don't want him to own it because the esoterics, remember, masonry has someone else as their deity. So where Jesus is depicted as Lord of this earth, those verses are systematically eradicated from the Bible. Revelation 14 verse 5. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. NIV, no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. King James. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. You see, here is a, an accountability towards a higher power. Here, there is no accountability. There could be an accountability to yourself. It means nothing. Here, it is important who rules. Revelation 22, verse 14, is a radical change. Blessed are those who wash their robes. I hope they use the right soap powder. I don't know what brands you have here, but maybe it makes a difference. Revelation 22, verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. Now, which one do you think is probably right? Here there's no accountability. And uh, what are you washing your robes with? What are you rush washing your robes with? Blessed are they that do His commandments. That's obedience. Let's change that. In the RSV, in the NIV, in the ASV, let's get rid of it. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Well, the Douay, which is basically the Jesuit Bible, or the product of the Jesuit Bible, and Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Thou shalt adore the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What's gone? Something's gone. RSV, same thing. And Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. The NIV, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve Him only. All of them leave something out. What do they leave out? Get ye behind me, Satan. Now why? Why do you leave that out? The expression, Get ye behind me, Satan, was early omitted because Jesus used the same expression later to Peter in Matthew 16, 23 to rebuke the apostle. And we wouldn't want the same spirit to be confused here. And this has to do with the doctrine of Peter becoming eventually a pope. It's quite a complex issue, but uh, there's a good reason why they took it out. Acts 13, verse 42. Sabbath. Now notice this subtle little change. This is very important for those who keep the seventh day Sabbath. King James. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue... The Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now remember that this is all based on Greek doctrine.
documents. The words are there. These are changes that were made by these individuals for a purpose. The Jue, which was again this one based on the Jesuit Bible, and as they, as they went out, they desired them that on the next Sabbath they would speak unto them these words. The RSV does the same thing. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. The NIV says, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. You see, in the King James, it says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue. What does that mean? It means that he was preaching to the Jews. And then the Gentiles came and said, will you preach this to us next Sabbath? That means that the Gentiles were willing to come on the Sabbath. Now, if you take the Jews out there, then it's not Saturday necessarily. If it's just they, it could be an ecumenical meeting, and Sabbath could then be any day. But linking it to the Jews, which day would it definitely be? Saturday. It would definitely be Saturday. So a subtle little change. These guys are so thorough. Do you think this is a slip of the pen? I don't think so. Now this one gets even worse. Very slight change, but very succinct. Acts 16, verse 7. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Jewe, and when they come to Mysia, da-da-da-da, and the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. The RSV does the same thing, the Spirit of Jesus, and the NIV does the same thing, the Spirit of Jesus. Now, why? You see, you have to understand the occult mind to understand this one. What happens here is the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God, tells them no. Here, it is now the Spirit of Jesus, which implies that the Spirit is in control of Jesus. Are you with me? The New Age teaches that when Jesus was one of the initiated masters that came to this earth, he didn't have power to do it right, so he was overshadowed by Matreya, who used him like a puppet. That's what they teach. Here, the same idea comes up. Jesus is controlled by the Spirit, and the Spirit tells them what to do. Here, the implication is, the Spirit says no, and if Jesus is the one who said no, then he and the Spirit are one. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Jue, for Christ our Pash is sacrificed. The RSV, for Christ our Pasha lamb has been sacrificed. The NIV, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Big deal. What's gone? For us. You see, the exclusivity of Jesus has to go. Sad state of affairs. The phrase through his blood is not found in either the Jesuit or American revised version. Its omission can be traced to Oregon, 200 AD, who expressly denies that either the body or soul of our Lord was offered as the price of our redemption. Now we must understand something here. The occultists teach that Jesus never really died for you. The occultists teach that Jesus had a esoteric body. He didn't come in the flesh. Now the Bible teaches that he who says that Jesus didn't come in the flesh is antichrist. The occultists teach that when he hung on the cross he just appeared to hang there for the Jews and that God whisked him away before he died so he never died a vicarious death for you. Do you understand the difference? So here we have the same idea. He was not sacrificed for us because esoterically he never died for you. Because you don't need a savior, you save yourself. You are God. This is arrogance of the highest degree. The power of God is denied. 1 Peter 1.22 
seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. The RSV says, having purified your souls by your obedience, your obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren for one another, blah, blah, blah. NIV, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. You see, here the obedience is something that you have achieved through purification of yourself. Here, the obedience that you have achieved has been made possible through the indwelling power of whom? Of God, through the Spirit. Which one would you prefer to be correct here? Never mind what you prefer. What do they change? Here, it is not God, it is not Christ in you that is working a change. It is your own power. This is occult, and that is biblical. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Now this is a very important little change. Wow, one little word, by, at. One tiny little, oh what difference does it make? It makes the world of difference at his appearing in his kingdom. I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, says the Jew, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. RSV says the same, by. NIV says, in view of. Hello? What does that imply? This implies that the judgment takes place when? When Jesus comes back. Jesus is going to come back. What does the other one imply? implies something totally different. Let's see. The King James in this text fixes the great day of judgment as occurring at the time of his appearing and his kingdom. The Jesuit and the revised versions and the NIV and the, all of the others place it in the indefinite future. Anywhere. It could happen at any time. In fact, Roman Catholicism teaches amillennianism. There is no millennium. The church reigns as the kingdom. Important point which is also not biblical, of course. So these things have to be changed to bring it in line with Roman Catholic thinking. Hebrews 7.21, King James. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that says unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so Jesus was a priest of a different order, of a higher order. Because only Levites were allowed to be priests, but Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And as a, someone from the pride of, tribe of Judah, how could he be a priest? But he was of a higher order, of the order of Melchizedek, who was king of Salem. Now, what's the Jew I do? Thou art priest forever. Well, where's the rest? What does the RSV do? Thou art priest forever. What does the NIV do? You are a priest forever. After the order of Melchizedek is gone, so Jesus hasn't got a higher priesthood? Isn't that interesting? Did you know that the Freemasons, when they are initiated, are of the order of Melchizedek? Did you know that a Mormon, is in, when he is initiated into the higher degrees, is of the order of Melchizedek? So he stands higher than Jesus? That's fascinating. Okay, so let's make Jesus a little bit less than what he should be. John 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in, the, in them you have eternal life. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. The NIV, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. What's the difference between them? Here it is a command. Search the scriptures, semicolon, for in them you think you have eternal life. Here, it is they who are, have the initiate. On this point, the Dublin Review, notice this, this is a Catholic newspaper, or a Catholic article, July 1881 says the following, but perhaps the most surprising change of all is John 5, 39. That's the one we just read. It is no longer search the scriptures, but ye search, 
and thus Protestantism has lost the very cause of its being. So they knew what they were doing and why they changed it. Because we believe that you have to search the scriptures to find eternal life. And here, Protestantism is scrapped because just they believe. A deadly blow against miracles, John 2.11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. RSV, signs. NIV, miraculous signs. Not miracles anymore. Jesus, what Jesus did was a miracle. It's something that no one else could do. Jesus was special. He was different to anyone. He was not a magician. The word miracle is found singular and plural 32 times in the authorized version of the New Testament. Alas, what desolation has been wrought by the revised. In 23 of these instances, the word miracle has entirely disappeared. In the case of the other nine, although the term is used in the text, its force is robbed by a weakening substitute in the margin. Our authorized Bible vindicated by Professor Wilkinson. Doctrine of conversion. Notice how this is undermined in Matthew 18, 2 and 3. And Jesus said, Except ye be converted and become as little children. And he said, Unless you turn and become like little children. Turn to what? NIV, unless you change and become like little children. Change how? Conversion is a very strong term and implies exactly what it means. Remove it. Let's go a little deeper. Human knowledge exalted above the divine word of the, by the revision. Without him, says John 1, 3 and 4, was not anything made that was made in him was life. The RSV puts in the margin, without him was not anything made, that which has been made was life in him. Now these are subtle little changes. Now let's just check out how it goes further. No creation, evolution instead. Hebrews 11 verse 3. King James. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The RSV says in the margin, By faith we understand that the ages have been framed by the word of God. Now it's ages. Okay. The NIV does this. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Now you will say, you know, I really don't get it. It doesn't look like such a big deal. Here it's the worlds, there it's the universe. You know, what's the big deal? Well, let's go and find out what Professor Hort had in mind when he suggested this change. Let's ask him. It's nice to go to the horse's mouth. Well, Professor Hort on Westcott, what did you say? Westcott writes, in this connection we see the full meaning of the words used of creation in Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the worlds, the ages, the universe, there's the NIV word, under the aspect of time, have been formed by the word of God. The whole sequence of life and time, which we call the world, has been fitted together by God. His one creative word included harmonious unfolding on one plan of the last issues of all that was made. That which is in relation to him, one act at once, is in relation to us. Oh, they write so nauseatingly, but let me continue. Evolution apprehended in orderly succession. See, what did he believe in? He believed in evolution. And if you believe in evolution, then you have to change the word just so subtly so that you don't get the import of the first version. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. That's pretty clear. No doubt, right? Jesus did it. RSV, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for in him all things were created. Well, if we're all divine, could be in us too, right? The new language of the revised and the judgment of the revisers hinders the application of these texts to a material creation, as in the King James, and limits them as a spiritual application to Christianity. So there we go. Let's just change the whole doctrine of creation. King James, Hebrews 1 verse 2, By him also he made the worlds. RSV, through him also he made the ages. NIV, through whom? 
he made the universe. Now it's possible to spiritualize creation. Subtle, subtle changes. Ephesians 3 verse 9 really irritates me. The NIV says, And to make plain to everyone the administration of his, this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. What do you think the King James says? Well, let's read it. Who created all things by Jesus Christ? Away with Jesus Christ. Don't you think there's a subtle attack on Jesus Christ here? Or maybe not such a subtle attack, right? Maybe it's a pretty blatant attack on Jesus Christ. But the Spirit suffered them not. We've had that already, the Spirit of Jesus in the margin. The Jewe is like the revised on this change. Milligan says, Acts 16.7, the striking reading of the Spirit of Jesus, not simply as in the authorized version, this Spirit, implies that the Holy Spirit had so taken possession of the person of the exalted Jesus that he could be spoken of as the Spirit of Jesus. So this is the exposition, this is what the experts say, so that's exactly the change that they wanted. Now, remember that Hort denied the atonement. They hated the doctrine that Jesus Christ died for you by the shedding of his blood. Colossians 1.14, King James, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The Jesuit version, in whom we have redemption, the remission of sins. What's gone? Through his blood. Well, what's the RSV say? In him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Strange. And the NIV, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the Jesuit Bible. So basically, if you read the NIV, you're reading the Jesuit Bible. Through his blood, gone. Change in the doctrine? For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We've had this text, but I just want to show it to you again. There it is. The for us is removed in the RSV, and it's removed in the NIV. So... No difference. One writer thus registers his indignation upon the change made in this passage. He writes, here's Reverend Burke's and Dr. Warfield's collection of opinions. Mad! Yes, I'm mad, he says. Yes, and haven't I reason to be mad when I find that grand old passage for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, a passage which sounds the keynote of the whole doctrine of redemption, unnecessarily changed into for our Passover, also has been sacrificed, even Christ. And we have such changes everywhere. They are, I believe, called improvements in style by their authors and certainly by no one else. I like his style. This guy's got guts. Uh, yes, I agree with you, 100%. What about the set doctrine of the second coming of Christ? Wouldn't it be interesting if they could change that as well? Matthew 24, verse 3, King James. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? RSV in the margin. What shall be the sign of thy presence and of the consummation of the age? Okay. So Jesus doesn't have to come with the clouds. He can just sort of you know, sneak around, appear here, appear there. If you hear he's here, if you hear he's there, don't go. You know the story. Let's go on. Philippians 3, 20, 21. King James. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, the RSV and the ASV uh, say, who shall fashion anew the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory? Now what's the difference between those two? Why do they go to so much trouble to make those changes? Well, let's ask them. The change in us, indicated by the King James, according to this and other scriptures, is a change that occurs only at the second coming of Christ. It is a physical change of tangible reality, but the change called for by the revised may occur at any time before his coming, or be continuous as you are changing, as you become a more accustomed to Christianity. It may be a change from the abstract vices to abstract virtues. See, they've spiritualized the way the coming of Christ. He comes in glory, and you are changed instantly. That's what the Bible teaches. They don't like that. They prefer reincarnation. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. 
Here's an interesting one. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, as that day of Christ is at hand. That at hand means soon to come. Revised, now present. Aha. Uh -huh. This implies that it could actually be right there. Now, has already come, says the NIV. So, here again, subtle changes changing the story of the second coming. Titus 2 verse 13, King James. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Awaiting RSV, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you notice the subtle change? By changing the adjective glorious to the name, noun, glory, the revisers have removed the second coming of Christ from the text. Now, it's not he that comes, it is something that could happen at any time. Revelation 1.7 He cometh with the clouds, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Notice this change, King James Version. Because of him. The revised. He is coming with the clouds, and all the tribes of earth shall mourn over him. Now, what does it mean? Remember that Hort said, we'll change it here a little bit, we'll change it there a little bit. Bishop Westcott himself states, All the tribes of the earth shall mourn over him in penitential sorrow, and not as the authorized version shall wail because of him in the present expectation of terrible vengeance. Aha! So now when Jesus comes, according to this one, they will all say, we're sorry for what we did, and he'll say, fine, my children, Come, you are all saved. Whereas in the previous one, there was a judgment at the flood, and there will be a judgment at the end. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Yes or no? Aha, uh -huh. it's gone. It's spiritualized away. Do you have another chance, you know? Again, burn it off on the other side, or reincarnate again, or whatever. Dr. Alexander Roberts, a member of the English New Testament Committee, is of course for the change. What does he say? Acts 3, 19 and 20, an impossible translation here occurs in the authorized version, which implies that Jesus will come to judge the world. No, we don't want that, he says. Repent ye therefore, and then he reads it again. And he says, for eschatological reasons, it is most important that the true rendering of this passage should be presented. It is thus given in the revised version. So, we've changed it so that there is no judgment when Jesus comes. Nice. Thank you. Most of the revisers did not believe there would be a personal return of Jesus before the restitution of all things, which the authorized rendering of this passage teaches. So there's a whole change of doctrine here. This is very important if you believe in the advent of Christ and what's going to happen. Mark chapter 7 verse 19, Because it entereth not in the hearts, but into the belly. Notice this change. This is so vile, this change. So sneaky. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out in the draught, that means when you go to the toilet, purging all meats, foods. So basically the King James says it doesn't go into the heart, it goes into the stomach, and it goes out, and then it's gone. The RSV says, since it enters not in his heart, but his stomach, and so passes on, thus he declared all foods clean. Hello? Where does he declare foods clean in this one? Nowhere. Now let's read what the NIV says. It gets even more blatant. Oh boy, this is some change. For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Where does it say that? It doesn't say it anywhere. So we've got a whole new doctrine here. Okay, interesting. So for those who really love the NIV, you'll have a hard time proving some interesting facts. Luke 23, 44 and 45, King James. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened. So that was a miracle, showing that Jesus was the Son of God, and here was a celestial miracle. RSV says the sun's light failed. And the Moffat translation says, owing to an eclipse of the sun. I wonder where they get that from. So no miracle over here. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 leaves out that you have to fast sometimes, or that fasting might be beneficial. 
John 9 verse 4, one little word changed. Notice this, how cute they are. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The RSV and the NIV says, we must work the works of him who sent me. What's the difference between the two? It's a massive difference. In the one, Jesus is the only one who can do this work. Here we can all do it. I will show you modern day preachers in lectures to come that stand up on the pulpit and say, they could have saved you just like Jesus could. I'll show you preachers, high-ranking preachers in the world, who say that exact thing. And, well, no problem. You can use this text in the new reversions to do that. One little change. Here, 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing, very important again, and by his appearing. That same change where the doctrine of the coming of Christ is changed. 1 Corinthians 11.9. Now, here you have the whole question of transubstantiation, the whole mass story coming up. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. RSV, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. The unworthy is gone and the Lord is gone. The NIV, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Wow, this, this is Roman Catholicism. This is a host. Here you have transubstantiation. The omission of unworthy and Lord therefore condemns Protestants who do not believe that the bread has been turned into the body of Christ. This is a Jesuit Bible. The NIV is a Jesuit Bible, make no doubt. I used to read it, and I still have it on my shelf, but I like to use it to show people the changes. So don't throw them away. Keep them. Make a whole series of them. Now what about the restoring the confessional? Roman Catholicism teaches the confessional. King James says, confess your faults one to another. The RSV, therefore confess your sins one to another. The NIV, therefore confess your sins to each other. The Dublin Review, this is a Catholic newspaper, July 1881 says, the apostles have now power to forgive sins and not simply to remit them. Confess your sins is the new reading of James 5.16. So was it deliberate, yes or no? It was deliberate. It was very deliberate. So they can get the confessional into the NIV. Hebrews 10.21, King James, and having a high priest over the house of God, and high priest. RSV, a great priest. NIV, a great priest. Okay? That means it implies that there can be other priests. If there is a great priest, it implies there can be priests that are not so great, also officiating, but and priest is one priest. So now you can have a priesthood, very important. And this is a bomber. I want you all to take note of this text. Everyone sitting here. This text is very important for you, and it's incredibly important for me. The whole church government is changed in Acts 15, verse 23. The King James. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greetings unto the brethren. Okay? Who sends these greetings and this information? The apostles, the elders, and the brethren send out the first apostolic letter to the churches. The RSV. With the following letter, the brethren, both the apostles and elders, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles. The NIV. With them they sent following letter, the apostles and elders, comma, your brothers, to the Gentile believers. What does this do? This is very important. All they've changed is basically a comma. That's all they've done. It's a very subtle change. 
But it's a mighty, 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 mighty change. And I'll tell you why. Because here you have three groups officiating in the church. You have the apostles, you have the elders, and you have the brethren. And Peter says, you are all priests. Does Peter say that? Yes or no? You are all priests. That's what Peter says. Here, you have two groups. You have the apostles and the elders, and then you have the brethren. Now, what did they think about this? Here we go. This passage is used as a foundation on which to base an argument for a clergy separated by God in their function from the lay brethren. It makes a vast difference in sending out this authoritative letter from the first council of the Christian church, whether it issued from the apostles and elders only, or whether it issued from the apostles, elders, and the brethren. Here again, to effect this change, the revisers omitted two Greek words. So they changed it by leaving out two Greek words, and now they have the apostles and the elders, and then they have the brethren. Have you heard people say, you should not be preaching this, you're not a theologian? Have you heard that? What right have you to stand and preach the word of God? You are not a theologian. I'll tell you, I have heard that many, many times in my life. I'm not a theologian. No, I'm a brethren. And so are all of you, brethren. And you have the right to preach the word of God because you are priests of the Most High. To change it, you are, have no right to preach, you are not a theologian, is Jesuit teaching. It's from the pits of hell. It's not biblical. And everybody is a priest of God. So ignore them when they say you're not a theologian. You have the right to read the Word of God just as they have the right to read the Word of God. Very important changes and they irritate me. This name then of priest and priesthood, properly so called, as St. Augustine said, here we go back to the church fathers, which is an order distinct from the laity and vulgar people, ordained to offer Christ in an unbloody manner in the sacrifice to his heavenly Father for us to preach and minister the sacraments and to be the pastors of the people they wholly suppress in their translations. See the point? Augustine says, we are holy priesthood and you are just profane rubbish. We'll tell you what to believe. No, no, no. The Bible says no such thing. And that early letter, very important. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. That's pretty clear. RSV. And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. NIV. To die once, and after this to face judgment. Now let's ask these people what the change meant. Canon Farrar claims the change was deliberate. And Canon Farrar ought to know because he was a member of the Apostles Club. Remember that club that Hort belonged to, that secret society? Farrar said in this change, there is a positive certainty that it does not mean the judgment in the sense in which that word is popularly understood by abandoning the article, which King James translators here incorrectly inserted, the revisers help, as they have done in so many other places, silently to remove deep-seated errors. Well, you're an apostle up there, but an apostle of another kind, I believe. At the death of each of us, there follows a judgment. As the sacred writer says, the judgment, the final judgment, may not be for centuries to come in the omission of that unauthorized little article from the authorized version by the revisers no, lies no less a doctrine than that of the existence of an intermediate state. Aha! So by leaving out the little article, you've got purgatory in your Bible. You can prove purgatory, but you cannot prove it is once to die and then the judgment. Luke 1, 72. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers, revised, and the NIV, to show mercy to our fathers. Now this is interesting. This is fascinating. Now you can show mercy to our fathers, so I can pray for the dead? Can I now pray for the dead? Apparently, yes. The text was one which, if rendered literally, no one could read without being convinced that at least sus suspected that the fathers already dead needed mercy, and that the Lord God of Israel was prepared to perform it to them. 
But where were those fathers? Not in heaven, where mercy is swallowed up in joy, and assuredly not in hell, of the damned, where mercy could not reach them. They must therefore have been in a place between both, or neither the one nor the other. What, in limbo or purgatory? Why, certainly, in one or the other. So now we have purgatory in the Bible. Did you know that it was there? If you have a modern translation, you can prove purgatory. Tremendous. The bishop further claims that the revisers, in making this change, vindicated the Jesuit New Testament of 1582 and convicted the King James of perversion. Right. Jesuit Bible. 1 Peter 4 verse 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. RSV. For this is why the gospel was preached even to the dead. NIV gets even worse. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Now, what does that mean? Well, here, the gospel, was it preached to those who are dead? Sure. In the past, the gospel was preached to those that are dead now. Here, it is still being preached to the dead. Acts 24, verse 15, And there shall be a resurrection of the dead. But the RSV says, there will be a resurrection for both the just and the unjust. Ah, so when you are dead, you are dead, and then you arise, according to the King James, but not according to the others. Now you can be a ghost. So let's see if we can find ghost theology. Job 19, verse 26. The NASV says, Even after my flesh is flayed, yet without my flesh I shall see God. So how do you see God now? As a spook. Casper the friendly ghost. That's how you will see him. What does the King James say? And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's a big difference. The one is a resurrection, the other one is not. Job 26, 5. Dead things are formed under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. The revised. They, the shades margin, they are deceased, tremble beneath the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Ooh, this is fascinating. This is complicated stuff. In the first one over here, dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. So, dead things are down there. The revised, now the deceased tremble underneath the waters. So there's something like hell or purgatory or something. The NIV, it gets more blatant. The dead are in deep anguish. Those beneath the waters and all that live in them. Wow. So now we have somebody burning down there in purgatory. So the NIV, again, teaches a totally unbiblical doctrine. King James, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Look what the NIV says. Unrighteously for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. What have we got here? You know, these Bibles are disgusting, as far as I'm concerned. They are disgusting. They are teaching a totally different doctrine here. The different regions of conscious dead, as Roman Catholics teach, supported by the revised. King James, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book, referring to the beast, now that is, of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. Here the Lamb was slain, slain from the foundations of the world. The RSV, and all that dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose names have not been written before the foundations of the world. Yet it's the people whose names have been written before the foundations in the book of life of the Lamb. The King James in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4 says, He rose again on the third day. The Revised said, He hath been raised on the third day. What's the difference between the two? The difference is in the one, He has power within Himself to rise from the dead, and in the other one, He gets raised because He's inferior to God. That's the difference. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Very interesting, the Mass. He broke it and he said, Take it, this is my body which is broken, the RSV. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now we have a host. We have a literal body. So this is Catholic doctrine. That is not. 
Christ is with us always, not in person, but by His Spirit. The Revisor's doctrine of the Incarnation of the Mass therefore makes unnecessary and destroys the truth that He shall come to the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. Cardinal Wiseman exults that the revision movement vindicated the Catholic Bible. Look what he says. When we consider the scorn cast by the Reformers upon the Vulgate and their recurrence in consequence to the Greek as the only accurate standard, we cannot but rejoice at the silent triumph which truth has at length gained over the clamorous error. For in fact, the principal writers who have avenged the Vulgate and obtained for it its critical preeminence are Protestants. Wow. I wonder whether they were Protestants. I think they were Jesuits disguised as Protestants because that's what we saw in the previous lecture. And we have similar statements here from the Reverend Thomas. The brief examination which I've been able to make of the revised version of the New Testament has convinced me that the committee have labored with great sincerity and diligence and that they have produced a translation much more correct than generally received amongst the Protestants. So he says, it is in line with the Catholic version and confirms the correctness of our Bible. There we go, so all these changes have been made. Catholic magazine claims the revised version is the death knell of Protestantism. Protestantism is going to go. The destruction of their temple, the Shekinah departed from the Holy of Holies. So perhaps it is to be with the English Bible, the temple of Protestantism. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to go. The Revitas had a wonderful opportunity. They might have made a few changes, says the Protestant journal, but they blew it. They destroyed it. One question I have for you. Is Jesus a liar? King James Version, John 7 verse 8. Go ye up into the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet full come. RSV, go to the feast yourselves. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Here Jesus says, I'm not going, but he went. Here Jesus says, I'm not yet going, and then he went. So here he's telling the truth, and there's a liar. You choose whether you want Jesus to be a liar, or whether you don't want to, him to be a liar. The greatest damage of all is when you take away the deity of Christ. Islam makes Christ a man. Now I'm going to give a whole lecture on this, so I'm not going to talk on this issue. Matthew 6, 22. God forbid, Lord, far be it from thee, Lord. Slight difference, we won't go into the details. Titus 2, 1, 3. Awaiting our blessed hope, the RSV, the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The ASV, looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the King James says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here Jesus is God. Here he has only the glory that God gives him. So he is subordinate to God in the RSV and the ASV. The Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Listen to this change. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman will, shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Please explain to me how a young woman conceiving a child can be a sign for anyone. Who could qualify? Everyone. So it's not a sign at all. It's pathetic. But the King James Version says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now that's a sign. That's strange. That's something special. Jewish scholars amongst the RSV translators, so they obviously wanted this change, Rabbi Balfour Brickner writes the following, I am delighted to know that at least this great error of translation has been finally corrected and that at least some elements of the Christian world no longer officially maintain that Isaiah 7.14 is a prediction that Jesus was to be born of the Virgin Mary. Okay, so they've just removed his virgin birth. RSV, your divine throne endures forever. Thy throne, O God, is forever. The name of God is here reduced to the adjective divine, but when this text is quoted in Hebrews 1 verse 8, it is made to apply to the Son. So we better change it here in Psalms, or else Jesus might be God, you see. Because Hebrews 1 verse 8 says, 
But unto the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. But of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You see, even the RSV is the same there as the King James. So where did they change it? They changed it in the Psalms so that Jesus wouldn't have it applied to him. Now, this gets pretty serious. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. RSV, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work. What is Jesus now? He's a created being. The NIV, the Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. What is he in the NIV? He's a created being. The Lord possessed me in the beginning. He was part of God in the beginning. So in the King James, he's God. Here he is a created being. Daniel 3 verse 25 calls him son of the gods. Son of gods. Son of the gods. King James, son of God. Big difference. Now again, Micah 5 verse 2, RSV. From you shall come forth for me one who is to bear ruler in, in it, whose origin is from old, from ancient days, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. So here he has an origin, he's created, and there he has no creator. Matthew 1 verse 25. He's no longer the firstborn son. He's just, you will have a son. King James, he's the firstborn son, so she was a virgin. But if they removed the virgin bit, they better remove it here too. So they removed it in the RSV. And it goes, gets even worse. In the footnote they say, that Joseph is the father of Jesus. The King James, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. See? So here he is miraculously born. There he has an earthly father. And if we go to the King James, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The Jewe, his father and mother were wondering at those things. So what happened now? Jesus no longer has a miraculous birth. And uh, you'll find the same in the NIV. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said. Matthew 13, 51. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. RSV says the same thing. Yes, the King James says, Yea, Lord. So they recognize him as God, curious. Oh, by the way, that's been removed many, many times, hundreds of times in the NIV. Everywhere where it says Jesus is Lord, that's gone in the NIV. This one's very interesting. Matthew 19, 16 and 17. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? One there is who is good. Good master. There's a difference. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? You see the difference? There is none good but one that is God. Now what's the difference here? This is a fascinating text. You see, in the RSV, goodness is not applied to the person. In the King James, he is calling Jesus good master. And Jesus recognizes something in him. And he says to him, why do you call me good master? For surely you know that there is one that is good and that is God. So what is he saying? You have recognized something. What have you recognized? You have recognized that I am God. That's what he says to him. So that's gone. That's changed. So that Jesus is not recognized by this young man as God. We're going to get deeper into this. Matthew 27, 35. Everywhere, just about everywhere in the New Translations, where the Bible says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Everywhere where the Bible says that, the modern translations have removed it. Why do you think they have removed it in the modern translations? I'll tell you why. Because... It proves that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. And so they've taken it away, so that he does not fulfill prophecy. Everywhere. Matthew 2.15 Out of Egypt I have called my son, out of Egypt did I call my son. 
Hosea is now not a fulfillment of prophecy because those are the exact words used in Hosea applied in the New Testament. They change them so that Hosea is not a fulfillment of that prophecy anymore. Mark 15 verse 3. And he answered nothing, it says. And the chief priest accused him of many things, the King James says, but he answered nothing. Why is that left away in the RSV, in the NIV, in the ASV? I'll tell you why. Because it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. Take it away. Jesus must not fulfill the prophecy. He's no better than any one of us. And the scripture was fulfilled which says that he was numbered with the transgressors. RSV gone. Mark 15 verse 28. 1 John 4 verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a central doctrine. It's not of God. It's the spirit of Antichrist. RSV. And every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. Oops. The NIV. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, if they leave it out, then I must assume that the NIV and the RSV was written by the spirit of Antichrist, right or not? Yes or no? Well, what do you say? Must be, because it's not there, so they're denying it. His post-resurrection appearance in the RSV, the original one, gone. Matthew 6, 13, King James. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Gone. Why did they leave it out? In the Jew, in the RSV, in the NIV? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Gone. Because Jesus must no longer be exalted. Luke 11, 2. Father, hallowed be your name. This is interesting. Your kingdom come, etc. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, NIV, King James. And he said to them, when you pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, why remove all those verses? You see, here, in the RSV and the NIV, you can pray to whom? You can have the Pope as Father. You can have the Pope. But here you can't, because our Father who art in heaven cannot be the Pope. So, let's take those verses out. Luke 11, 2, 8. And he said unto them, when you pray, the same story, you'll see all those texts, the RSV and the NIV, they're all taken out. Uh, Post-resurrection appearance omitted, Luke 24, 40, RSV missing. King James, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. So they took out Mark, so they take it out in Luke as well. What about his miraculous ascension? And he was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him. Gone, gone. While they blessed him, he parted from them, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. It's just gone. Leave it up. John 3, 13. Again, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. What does that make Jesus? It makes him God who is now in heaven. Just taken out. Now, notice this one. John 6, 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven. And the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven. There it's bread, and there it's a person. Big difference. Jesus is systematically removed in the modern translations. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes has eternal life. Who believes what? That frogs are gods? And there are religions that believe that, by the way, today, alive and living in a well, in Japan, for example. Who believes what? Mother Teresa says, whatever you believe God is, that you must accept. That's good enough. No, no, no. The King James says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has eternal life. Gone. Two little words. They make a big, big difference. John 16, 16. RSV. A little while and you will see me no more. Again a little while and you will see me. I laugh about this text. You know what this text means? Jesus was playing hide and seek. He was peeping behind a tree. He was standing there behind a tree and he says, Now you see me. Now you don't. Now you see me. Now you don't. 
It's pathetic. God wouldn't put a stupid text like that in the Bible. The NIV, well, it's just as stupid. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Well, I'm going to stand behind a tree. That's what I'm going to do. The King James says, A little while and you shall see me, and again a little while and you shall, s you shall not see me, or a little while you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. That makes sense. Which one do you think God spoke? You tell me. Come on. Obviously this one. This is pathetic. This is absolutely pathetic. I get angry sometimes. I must calm down. John 16, 23. If you ask anything of the Father, He will give it to you in my name. Whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. There's a huge difference between that text. You just think about it. Here, the whole character of God and His truth is implied. Here, anything goes. Acts 2, verse 30. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon the throne. Here, yeah, oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Why do you think the of his flesh is out? Why do you think so? Because they deny the doctrine of the physical coming of God in the flesh. He who denies it is what? Antichrist. So again we have the spirit of Antichrist in the RSV. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. Well, this is a sad one. The whole atonement gone. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The whole verse, verse 37. Take it out. Not Jesus saves you. You save yourself. That's how you get saved. You save yourself. Acts 9, verse 29. He talked and debated with the Greek and Jews, but they tried to kill him. Interesting. King James. He spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. You see? What makes the difference? Jesus makes the difference. If you want an ecumenical Bible, well, here's argument and debate. But here the debate is about Jesus Christ. He makes the difference. Acts 22, 16. And wash away your sins, calling on his name. NIV. And wash your sins away, calling on his name. And wash away the sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Just one of those where they've removed him. The gospel concerning his son. His son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here it could be his son, Lucifer. Here it is, the son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Big difference. Romans 9, 5. According to the flesh is the Christ, God who is over all. As concerning the flesh, Christ came who is over all. Yet Jesus is higher than everyone else. They're hmm, different. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of God, says the RSV in Romans 14.10. But the King James says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That makes Christ God. And not only that, it exalts Jesus as the judge. But here, they have removed this privilege from Jesus and made it sort of general. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Big difference. Now, 1 Timothy 3.16, God, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. He was manifested in the flesh. Who was manifested in the flesh? Hello, would you care to look at me? I am manifested in the flesh. Can you see me? I'm flesh and bones. It's no big deal. But here, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. There's a difference. Do you see how they systematically reduce Jesus and how they take him out of the Gospels? It's a shame. It's a crying shame. And this one is the bomber. Do you know how much debate there is in the world today about the Trinity? And they say, Trinity is not doctrine of the Bible. It has to be removed. And they're right, you cannot prove it in the NIV and you cannot prove it in the RSV. You cannot prove the Trinity. And they say, it's Roman Catholic doctrine. 
No, hang on a second. Roman Catholic doctrine is father, mother, child on the esoteric inner circle. For the Goyim, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the esoteric doctrine of Roman Catholicism, I'll prove this in a later lecture, is Father, Mother, Child. But it is a copy of the heavenly. And here you can see it. 1 John 5 verse 7. For there are three that testify. Nothing said. King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That makes Jesus God and part of the triune Godhead. This text shows that there are three powers in heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three are in the fullest sense God. That's what the text says. Out. Away with it in the modern translations. God re resteth upon you, and their part is evil spoken of by on your part he is glorified. Gone. The glorification of Jesus removed from 1 Peter 4 verse 14. Revelation 1 and 11, what do they remove? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Gone. His eternal Godhood removed. Revelation 5 14. And the four, four beasts said Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. His eternal Godhood, He is eternal, gone out of the RSV, gone out of the NIV. Well, Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, But He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How must you know what God said if they've confused it to such an extent? And just based on simple logic, which one do you think is the most probable correct text? The one as rendered in the King James or the one as rendered in the other versions? Which ones do you say? What do you say? It can only be the King James because the others, some of the verses are so pathetic. That's the only word for them. So pathetic. It's a nice word. Rolls off the tongue. That they make no sense whatsoever. Now here's an interesting story. This is St. Catherine's protectorate, Mount Sinai. Now, what was given at Mount Sinai? What did God give to Moses at Mount Sinai? Amen. He gave the law. He gave the whole Bible to him, the Pentateuch, the first five books. He received them directly from God, and he wrote them down in a book, and it's called the Law of Moses. And this camel has nothing to do with it. He's just there to look cute. Now, here is Mount Sinai. They say that the tablets of stone were hewn from this very rock. Well, that's just a uh, traditional delivery. Up we go to Mount Sinai. Here it is where God spoke. If this is the right place, we're not really sure, but nevertheless. Where God spoke in great majesty and gave the law. On top there's a little Coptic church, and uh, it's tough climbing up there. My feet were sore. And uh, let's go down and go, and then we find something else. Elijah's Basin. There's the sign, Mount Sinai, Elijah's basin down there. And tradition says this is where Elijah came when he ran away from Jezebel. Now, think about this. Here at Sinai, God sends out his words. It's a great thought. Elijah ran to this place, and this is where he hid from Jezebel. Why did he run from Jezebel? What had he done that he should run from Jezebel? I'll tell you what he'd done. He'd had a confrontation with the priests of Baal. A mighty confrontation between truth and error. And after the confrontation, God took him back all the way to Sinai. That's where the word came from. That's what made the confrontation possible. Now, what stands on Mount Carmel today? a huge Baha'i temple which preaches that all religions are the same, there's no difference between the various religions. So it seems as if in the last days a new doctrine has come in. No difference between religions. But Elijah preached there is a difference and there is a judgment. And he comes back to the law here, Sinai, 
Today, no, on Mount Carmel, there is a Baha'i temple which says all religions are exactly the same. And something else. From Sinai, the word of God went into the worlds. And from Sinai today, something else goes into the world. There's a monastery. It's St. Catherine's Monastery. That's where the Sinaiticus text was found. That is the text on which all the corruptions which we've just read in the Bible are based. So here, from Sinai, a new word is sent out into the worlds. A corrupt word. So, Carmel is corrupted. There is no difference. God is not a God that says, come out, be separate, make a difference between them and those that worship the living God is the one message sent into the world today. And the other one is, here is the ecumenical word for you. We are all one. We are sitting in one pot. The devil hates Carmel. The devil hates the law of God. And he is counteracting it right here. He has taken that which God used and made it his own. He is sneaky. Wouldn't you agree? I think he's very sneaky. 1 Kings 18.21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. They would have preferred to worship both. Then we would have had peace and quiet. Today they want to do the same thing. They want to worship both. Now I would like to invite three people, three volunteers, one with an NIV, one with a Revised Standard Version, if you have one with you, and one with a King James, just to come up to the front, and we'll do a little experiment. Just a quick one, just for fun. Let's do it. This is great. Now, I don't know how quickly we're going to find these texts, but let's just look up a few. Will you look up Matthew chapter 17, verse 21? Will you read it to me out of the King James? Howbeit this kind of goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This one goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. What does the NIV say? He replied, because you have... That's 20. No, I want only verse 21, please. Okay. Why doesn't it say 21 here? It's oh, oh, it doesn't say 21. What, is, what does the RSV say? It doesn't say either. Oh, the RSV doesn't say it either. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 11. 18, verse 11. What does the King James say? For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Oh, that's a potent verse. How many sermons have been preached on that word? What does the NIV say? It, it says verse 10 and verse 12. There is no verse 11. There, there is no verse... Oh, okay. What does the RSV say? Same. You can't find it in there? No. Oh, that's rather sad. What about Matthew 23, verse 14? Could you read that for me, please? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Wow. The clergy that is so exalted now gets... One knock. What does yours say? No, 14. There's 13 and 15. Oh, the, the, surely, you know, they must be so exalted Jesus made a mistake with that verse. <laughs> Let's just take it out. What does yours say? Nothing. Oh, it doesn't have it either. What about Mark 7, 16? Mark? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 14 and 15, but no verse 16. No verse 16. No, not either. It's important to listen to the word of God. Now let's take that out. What about Mark 9.44? Mark 9.44? 9, 9.44. 44. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There's a verse 43. And a verse 45, but no verse 44. No verse 44. No, I can hear. No verse 44. That's an interesting text. We can deal with it in a later lecture. What's about verse 46? Verse what? 946. 
for where the worm di the dies same one. Not and the fire is not yeah. It's left out both times, right? There's a verse 45 and a verse 47, but no verse 46. Well, what about Mark 11, 26? Mark 11, 26. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Well, there's a verse 25 and a verse 27, but no verse 26. You know, we could go on like this for a long, long time. None of those vo verses will be there. So let's go to some interesting verses that are there. Let's go to Acts 9, verse 5 to 6. Acts chapter 9, verse 5 to 6. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Acts 9, 5 and 6. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Okay, and then the RSV. Who are you, Lord? A and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So what has been left out? The whole P part where there is opposition and battling against two options. So. In an ecumenical Bible, you don't want division, you want unity. So all these division texts where you make a decision, they're gone in the new ones. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's all. Where's the last bit? Not there. Oh. So if you have Jesus, you are saved. No change necessary in your life. What about the RSV? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No change need needed who walk not after the flesh. Does that apply a change and a conversion? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Gone. Because we want to have one big unity. What about... These are all texts that we didn't even deal with in this lecture. And we could carry on and on and on and on and on with them. What about 1 Timothy 3.16? Let's just look at that one. There we go. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy? Timothy 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What is it, verse 3, 16? Yes. 316. Uh, it's not in here. Right here. There it is. Oh. There's a little bit of it there. The, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And you have the same. He was, right? He was. Yes. It says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And... If you take that home with you tonight, then that is the crux of the matter. The King James Version says, 
God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save you. Jesus Christ is the only one whereby you can be saved. Because he's the only one who made you, and therefore he's the only one who can redeem you. He's the only one who can open the seals of the scroll. No one else, no created being, no angel, only Jesus Christ. And if you want to prove any of the doctrines of the Bible, you better have a King James or any other Bible that existed before these early 1900s. You can take the Russian Bible. You can take the Serbian Bible. You can take the old Croatian Bible. You can take the Luther 1912 Bible. Just don't take the 1984. You will find a tremendous change. You can take any old Bible in the world, except the Douay, of course, and the Vulgate, and you will find all the doctrines necessary for understanding salvation in Christ Jesus. But any new translation, treat with suspicion. In, Afri in the Afrikaans, in my own country, the old Afrikaans Bible, tremendous, exactly the same as the King James, the new, like the NIV. In Germany, if you have an Elberfelder Bible, it's exactly like the NIV. You can find none of the doctrines in it anymore. You will have to get a Luther 1912 or a Schlachter Bible in order to find the truth. And we could go right around the world. The Armenian Bible, fantastic, fantastic. They are now writing a new Bible version in Croatia for the Serbian language. Forget it. It is a corruption. It's based on Westcott and Hort's translations. So, I hope tonight you have found that what you read really makes a difference. Now, let me tell you, I personally like the new King James Bible. I like it. But there are huge numbers of mistakes in it, horrendous mistakes in it, some that really destroy some pivotal doctrines. But I quite enjoy it because I put it in, because I use the King James to verify it, and I cross it out to where it's wrong, and my whole Bible is crossed out and redone and whatever. I find that fun. It keeps my mind going and active. And uh, so if you want to use another translation, just be aware of these issues. And then verify your studies with one that you can trust. And the Textus Recepticus has come down through the stream of time. It has been the one that led the, to, to the Reformation. It has been the one that people have stood and died for. And it is the one that will make a difference at the end. You believe me.